Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Victoria Shepard, author of A History of Delusions, The Glass King, A Substitute Husband, and A Walking Corpse, published by One World, and it'll be released uh, here in the States on July 19th. Victoria conceived and produced the 10-part series, A History of Delusions, for BBC Radio 4, and she's all, well, obviously a precursor of the book. Um, she's also produced many documentaries and major shows on BBC Radio 4. On one hand, we experience illusions, something that seems real but isn't, and we come to know that. A thirsty trek across the Sahara uh, and a lovely oasis ahead, or a magician fooling us into seeing something that wasn't there a moment ago, a rabbit or a three of spades. On the other hand, we experience hallucinations. We know that the coiled hose in the garden is not a snake, but appears to be the apparent perception of something that isn't there, but we generally recover. But a, a delusion on my non-existent third hand uh, is an unmovable conviction that we are dead or that our family has been substituted by identical doppelgangers or that we're being listened to constantly, every word, which is not really a delusion anymore. And that hel helicopters surround our flat and upon our emergence, they will open fire and kill us. So we remain closeted in rooms for the rest of our lives. And then they're divided into the erotic manic, the grandiose, the jealous, the persecutory, um, the somatic, which works both ways, and sometimes two or more. So I feel like I've experienced all of them on a temporary basis, except for a couple which may still hold on a bit. Um, sometimes our delusions may even be somatic for, for real, affected by Parkinson's or schizophrenia or even Lewy bodies. But as described in Victoria's book, delusions permeate our history. And whether you believe that you are made of glass or that you're dead, or you're being steampunked uh, with an heirloom, suffusing you with harmful gases, you fit into the sketch that Victoria has drawn and we are all the better for looking at it closely. So welcome, Victoria. And thanks Thank for so joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So as the subtitle suggests we do, let's start, and, and, I, and you have another uh, videos that I've watched. Go ahead, let, let's start with The Glass King because that delusion may be in some senses the most accessible in the book as well. Yes, and it certainly was my um, my entry delusion <laughs> to the whole to the whole to the whole topic and to becoming a sort of detective of delusions. I was I was researching something completely different um, for a radio documentary um, a few years ago, um, and I was reading a fairly esoteric um, text, historic text, um, when this anecdote it was the history of the heart. I was making a program about. And off the pages of this history book, um, an aside was mention of a French king, King Charles VI of France. He's a 14th into 15th century uh, king of France, who the, the chronicle mentions, believed that he had turned into glass. Um, and I thought, A, you know, I, I, I immediately, um, pretty quickly jumped the, the previous um, topic um, because it, it's an extraordinary idea. Um, and it got more extraordinary that the scenario apparently, you know, here's this king of France who publicly anyway is fighting an endless war of attrition with England, the Hundred Years War. So he has a pretty busy day job. Um, but privately, what he's what he's terrified of and life and death terrified of is smashing. And he is reported to have um, wrapped himself in blankets and had steel iron rods, forgive me, uh, put into his trousers to stop him shattering should he come in contact with um with some with a hard surface and it's an absurd scenario um but there's more going on than that and when you sit and kind of really sit with this with this absurd picture it starts to seem more and more understandable um and uh you know you can start to see glass and the properties of of course glass at the time was a, was a relatively new um technology he may have seen glass in shot cathedral windows or in goblets of his you know a court court drinking vessels but glass um in in a domestic space was was 
courtesy of, of plate glass, which was a new technology, which was much clearer, allowed for, for much, much clearer glass that was useful in domestic spaces for windows and so on. And it had an alchemical quality to it because you know, it comes from heating of sand, um, heating rock to very high temperatures, which creates something that's transparent, beautiful, fragile, but breakable. It also turns you into a treasure if you're made of glass. And, and I started to see, when I, when I started to see what, think, you know, what on earth was going on, what was worth this ridicule that the King of France was, was subjected to by the courts of Europe for, for saying he'd turned into glass, because it must be something pretty, um, pretty important by way of what protection or so, something it was offering him, offering him something that was worth uh, social ridicule. Um, and when you ask that question, you can see you start to and you start to think of what turning yourself into glass might offer you. And the answer comes fairly quickly that you can see how it might be a distance regulator. It's a way of telling the world how to treat you. Um, stay back, but also, you know, I'm, 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 I'm fragile, don't break me, but also I'm, I'm, a, I'm a precious treasure. I'm something to, to value. I'm, I'm worthy as well of kind of interpretation um, and attention. And I think that that, to me, the, 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 glass, the glass King says something really simple to get back to your initial question about how, how um, I think I've come to argue in the book anyway, that delusions function um, as they they are a way of demanding interpretation of sneak I came to see them as sort of communiques um, encoded their meanings encoded and encrypted and they demand of performative they demand an audience and attention and and, and and interpretation and if you sort of give them time you pull up a chair metaphorically speaking and you really listen to what what the communiques what they're what in what seems ostensibly completely crazy um, what you start to hear are, are, are all sorts of things that are far more understandable um, that are being communicated by delusions. And the Glass King, I think, because Glass still has that kind of fairy tale, it still has a magic to it now, even though, of course, it's far from new. We, you know, glass slippers and fairy tales and so on. Glass can still communicate a lot as a material. It's kind of unique. And so I think it is a useful starter um, as a way of thinking about what how how delusions delusions might be operating psychologically yeah and actually and even in my opinion even better starter was the very beginning when mm. you describe this guy making the glass and his joy at the fact that he's reached the proper temperature and wow and i'm familiar with that type of glass because i lived in this house it was built during the revolutionary war and it has that little snap off with the, the little piece in the, the bullseye uh -huh. yeah the bullseye. Uh, right and, right and, and then I thought of, and you quote it, uh, Arthur Clarke's third law, which is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think that's part of the reason. And what, and what you say in the book too, is it's not just the king. There's all these people that also believe it. And, and I'll let you go uh, further, but that's like the, the people in the United States that have these communes where they believe the world's gonna end and then it doesn't. And then not only do they not lose converts, they gain them. So let's explain that. Well, that I suppose, you know, and that crosses many other, particularly paranoid conspiracy theory speaks to this. But it seems to me in researching all of these 10 people's lives, forensically trying to find as close to fragments of their, of their true existence and, and what their daily struggles were, what, what, I've, what I've certainly found is that conflict kind of irreconcilable conflicting feelings ambiguity ambivalence is really hard to live with and human beings will do almost anything not to have to sit with conflict in their own minds and a good conspiracy theory simply organizes the enemy many delusions do that too they and i suppose glass does also but conspiracy is probably the simplest way of, of demonstrating that that it it creates a, a um a villain or, or a hero it, it creates a, a simpler story um and it, it gets rid it's a way of kind of uh, yes organizing the enemy and changing what are kind of assimilating conflicting feelings into a story sort of turning them transmogrifying them into, into something um into a, a simpler story with with good and bad and hero and villain and so on um, and that's whilst it may not be healthy in the in the medium and long term, uh, you know, certainly for, for our own psyche, I think we're, they're very tempting for that reason. Um, yes. And one can understand why why we why we come up with these wonderful uh, 
sometimes wild um, uh, sort of stories that seem completely um, crazy. The, the, the rationale, unconsciously, of course, is it makes sense if you look at it in those terms of reconciling conflict. It reminded me, you don't remember it. I mean, you know about it, but you don't remember it. I do. I was, I experienced it when the Beatles were very popular and this idea that Paul was dead and there were all types of clues about why he would, there's tons of evidence. There's always tons of evidence. Was that, it wasn't a mass delusion, but was that a delusion or a, just a simple wrong belief? That's where I get confused. I mean, that, you know, minds aren't neat. I think, you know, in terms of, in terms of the glass, in terms of conspiracies, um, I mean, what's strange, the first chapter in my um, book um, concerns her, her, her case note, kind of pseudonym is Madame M. She's a French housewife um, who you mentioned her in, the, in your introduction, um, went into a police station asking for a divorce in 1921 on the basis that her husband had been murdered and substituted for a double. Um, and the many of the things that I've realized now, um, having written the book, the children, she, her, her theory also encompasses the idea that children have been abducted um, all around France and buried in the catacombs under Paris. Um, and, you know, those, that idea of, of abducted children um, is in the QAnon theories. There are sort of um, visual images that are uncannily similar. Um, and so this idea, I suppose, I mean, I, I can't answer it, but I can, the kind of rhymes speak for themselves between these, these historic cases that I've looked at and, you know, stories that perhaps or tropes or kind of images that people seem to keep coming back to, um, to explain either things that um, we can't answer, like, uh, I mean, you know, the idea that Paul, Paul um, McCartney had died, it, you know, that's a sort of... Um, I guess that that kind of mixes in with an idea of, um, um, yes, I suppose a paranoid idea that uh, people are keeping secrets from you. You know that there's a sort of yeah. there's there's a the, the, you know that the government are keeping secrets from you, and you know even if the context and the and the um, the references are completely different, you've got pop culture and whatever. The the idea that there's a kind of an enemy. Um, in charge, keeping keeping child abductions or the death of a, of a famous person secret for their own to serve their own agenda, um, stay is consistent through all of these stories. I mean, I tell the story of James Tilly Matthews, who, like Madame M, he's a, a French tea broker in the 18th century. He got tangled up in the in the French Revolution, um, and he um, got predictably enough got himself into very hot water. Um, when the French think he's a spy and the English think he's a spy, manages somehow not to have his head chopped off by the guillotine, um, gets you know, unceremoniously kicked back to London where he's living in poverty. Um, and you know, his, his, out of this springs this extra, probably the most extraordinary um, delusion in the book, I think in terms of its kind of imaginative scope. You mentioned it in your introduction that he, he uh, goes into the Houses of Parliament in Westminster and shouts down um, at Lord, Lord Liverpool's government that there's, there's a conspiracy to uh, bring the revolution to, um, to Britain. Um, so, you know, like, I guess like Paul McCartney's dead, you know, they're keeping this horrible secret from you, but the nature of the secret is what is the centerpiece of the secret is what he called the heirloom, which was a kind of uh, Heath Robinson, proto Heath Robinson contraption using um, operated by a sort of gang of Dickensian style villains who are um, using it to emit, well, it's, it's emitting uh, magnetic rays into the heads of the politicians in, in Westminster to turn them, to change their minds politically and bring the revolution, um, bring the revolution to Westminster. Um, and so it's, it's completely wild. He was also a brilliant draftsman and he draws this delusion um, and it's extraordinary um, and wild, but it's it's operating in the same way. You know, there's there's a there's something going on we must attend to. There's a crime being committed, um, and he's sort of pleading for people to get involved and to solve this 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 villainy. Um, and of course, the world that he's actually actually living in is incredibly chaotic. You know, you you can find yourself on the wrong side. The wrong side and the right side can flip every 10 minutes during the terror in Paris, you know, it's absolute chaos. 
and you know there's you can when you sort of understand the the turmoil and the how much you know how many times a day you might find yourself about to be executed and by different sides um you can start to understand what the idea of a, of a conspiracy might offer you whilst it might sound nightmarish and he's he's distressed and angry and trying to get people on side to believe him there's also a clarity to it and i've come to see that as as completely understandable maybe, maybe problematic and didn't do him any favors he ended up spending the rest of his life um incarcerated in a in a pretty grim um london mental asylum but you know you it's more complicated than than simply being rambling um, lunacy which was how it was how it was presented or how it was interpreted at the time yeah that case and other cases reminded me of how there's this like inextricable tie between the the doctors and the psychiatrists that are taking care of these people and almost they are almost obsessed and either want to make yes. their career or just kind of get sucked into it that was fascinating i had no idea it is fascinating. And of course, those relationships and many of many of these stories, it's probably worth pointing out. It's in some it's a very French story, lots of this, because when um, delusions were first sort of categorized, classified as a discrete kind of psychological phenomenon, um, that that's really that really happened when psychiatry was beginning as a discipline. And that that was just um, after the, in the aftermath of the French Revolution and the big new um, asylums, kind of pioneering asylums that sprung up around and um, inside Paris at that time. So many of these cases are, are French. So it's worth sort of explaining that um, why there is a kind of French bias. Um, yes, I'm sorry, I've gone off the, <laughs> off it was the about question the, somewhat. It was about the, the people that glom. Oh, off. Yes, yeah. yes. And so these these Capgra with Madame M, who was the, the delusion of doubles, the illusion of doubles um woman um you know he's he's a great ex example he his relationship with madame m um, went on for years and years and years and that's so often the case interviewing taking detailed notes for the first time from people who were presenting with delusions um, and they get they get into this dance you know and, and often as well you know you see that war and trauma is the trigger for the delusion and it's a war that you know the, the doctors have lived through the same wars often i mean capra had served in the battle of the marne in, in world war one so these doctors had had lived through the same period of history and the same terrible terrible uh, traumas of of the first world war or particularly well, specifically with that case and so you know they have their own they have their own foibles um de clarembeau uh gaitan gatti and de clarembeau who's a uh, another psychiatrist um, in the 20s, it's a later case, he, he, he coins, coins this uh, delusion, which he called erotomania, um, the idea that somebody of, of high status is, is in love with you, it's a kind of reverse stalking. Um, and he, in fact, he was so deeply traumatised by his um, time in the war that he ended up taking his own life with his service pistol. Um, in his apartment, uh, so he, he begins. You know, he, he's in this. His his um his case is um, a woman who believed that George V of England. She's a French woman, but she, she travels consist constantly to and fro to London to get signals from uh, from the king that you know about when they're supposed to meet. She stands outside Buckingham Palace waiting to see the the curtains twitching. So he's writing her up and presenting her to his his psychiatrist um, peers and so on. But privately, he was. He was a absolutely fascinating character and strange uh, and completely intriguing and opaque in his own way. So he was also studying drapery um, at the Beaux Arts. He taught he taught um, sculpture and um, how fabric fell. And when he was found, they found his apartment was full of of draped mannequins draped in fabric. So he had his own kind of fixations and. Um, all sorts of things going on psychologically in parallel with these cases that he was writing about um, other people and particularly this woman who, who, who he was uh, looking at in terms of how she presented with, a, with erotomania. And privately he was collecting silk samples and draping them around mannequins and was obviously profoundly traumatized such that he took his own life um, staged in his, in his apartment. So yes, yeah, so that's a very, um, beguiling and disturbing example, but even if it's less 
traumatic or, or kind of more um, compassionate, even when, you know, and even when you kind of can see that, you know, there's a dated approach, you know, in terms of how they analyze what's going on, but they were, I, I have to take my hat off to them at the end of the day, they were really trying to pay their best attention for the first time, really, to often women's stories, um, to try to understand what was going on that was that was creating these fixed false beliefs. Um, and they, you know, they left for us this treasure trove of source material, which I've spent months going through. And I come to see them as, yes, as you say, one of them, in fact, uh, Professor Cotard, who, who who coined um, in the 1880s, who coined um, the walking corpse of title fame. Um, he ended up in a Proust novel um, as a slightly disguised Dr. Cotard with two, with two T's. <laughs> um, yeah, so they, they are kind of, they, they were very, you know, many of them were important cultural figures, really trying to push the boundaries of how to treat um, mental disturbance, how to categorize it, how to understand it. Um, and they were, as I say, traumatized um, by the same things and just as complex as their, as, their, um, as their patients. And one thing about writing about history of any kind is if your source material is sometimes one of the, is actually a character in the story, do you ever feel like you're dealing with unreliable narrators? And if so, how do you ameliorate that? <laughs> Yes, I mean, you're, you're certainly dealing with, well, whilst I, I don't doubt that they were well-intentioned, um, you know, for instance, it, it, the Madame M, who's, who's the delusion of doubles, or Madame X, who's the walking corpse, they become these kind of poster girls um, and boys for, for a type of delusion. And, you know, there's certainly an element of um, performative, you know, the competitive, professional, um, psychiatry happening at the same level and sometimes the person is inevitably sort of hide seems to hide behind their pseudonyms and of course they had to have pseudonyms to, in order to protect their identity um, and, and, and sometimes it's desperately frustrating because you want to ask the questions you know you're, I'm very much aware that uh, I can't talk to these people um, and, that, and that these are my intermediaries who had brought with them their own cultures um, the received wisdom of the time and delusions of us have been so um profoundly kind of and they've been such strong eras you know for, for so many centuries it was it was a humoral imbalance it was seen as a humoral imbalance you had too much black bile um and that's why that's why you had melancholy which was the kind of catch-all term within which delusions sat um or it, you were possessed by the devil you know after that it was very much possession and so the idea that it could be anything psychological, it could be a kind of psychodynamic element going on. It was so, so new. And so they don't ask the questions that we now long to ask about, about their context. And I suppose that was my project. Whilst it's, it, you know, they're, it's, they're incomplete, there are huge gaps. But, you know, if you really sort of paid attention to the notes, you can, you can piece together glimmers, glimpses of what really do feel like their true lives, their true struggles. And it's been remarkable and kind of given me they were great company. I wrote much of the book during the lockdown in my in my garrets in London. <laughs> and um, I spent they, they were good company. They really were. What's well, funny, because when you're reading about, like, say, Robert Burton and you're talking mm. about the whole world is nothing but melancholy. Mm. And, and then you have like these and the illustrations and diagrams are really good. Um, right. So you have this student perhaps reading Mallarmé languidly lying on by the side of a pond looking almost heroically melancholic yeah and so tell yeah tell Burton's story because in oh, a sense Burton. in a sense to me it's just self-fulfilling prophecy rather than delusion yeah I mean Bert, Burton you know I, I kind of pulled a, a trick on this one because Burton is the kind of organizing he, your man of all the material of delusions all roads lead back to Robert Burton he wrote the kind of yeah, the great organizing text of delusions in, in 1621. It had many, many subsequent editions, but he pillaged all the kind of libraries of Europe uh, to find cases that were going all the way back to antiquity um, of melancholy. So his book was called The Anatomy of Melancholy. And I very, very, very crudely, I guess it's what we would think of now as depression, but it's a sort of sadness and um, malaise. Um, 
and 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 as I said, uh, you know, delusions were seen within that, and it was it was a product of too much black bile and the humoral notion of the body that we had different yellow but different biles in balance in our body, and if they got out of balance, if you had too much black bile, you, you would experience melancholy. But that was very much so. He collects all the stories um, for us. Um, but then I, as I, as I looked into his life, because he's such an intriguing character, he was obsessively updating this, this compendium of, of melancholy and delusions. Um, I started to think that maybe he had a delusion of, of his own. Um, and that's my kind of, that's what I, that's what I um, propose in the book was that he, he uh, believed his own horoscope um, to such an extent so that uh, he actually, well, the rumours were, this, this is in the, in um, 1640, he died, and he was a, a scholar at Oxford University, at Christchurch University, and the rumours were that he'd been found hanged, that he'd hanged himself um, on the precise day that his horoscope had predicted that he would die. So he'd sort of, by his own hand, brought his, made his own delusions come true. Uh, whether, whether he took his own life we, we can never know they were just there were rumors um but certainly he battled with you know because he writes in the anatomy of melancholy about the warnings of people um you know believing bringing um things into to happening by simply believing them and warns against um superstition and horoscope and asking what the future is going to hold but privately he was certainly doing his own horoscopes we have evidence of that and astrology the kind of um, astronomy is happening in parallel so there's all these uh, scientific discoveries happening which require quite a lot of magical thinking to um, believe in any way the kind of new lenses for telescopes all kinds of new understanding about you know the earth going around the sun new planets being being discovered um, and then the old the old um, science in inverted commas or art of of, of astrology is still there people are still kind of mocking it you know Shakespeare mocks it it's being mocked on the London stage but clearly we know people had um took the horoscopes very seriously and in private probably believed them and, I mean as people do today we can hold those two things um we can we can sort of know that something is probably not true and yet deep down um be in its thrall and uh so he's he's a really interesting person and the question of whether he was but he was, I, I mean, almost certainly melancholic, or I would say depressed throughout his life. And he, he goes, I found evidence that he went to this sort of celebrity um, astrologer called Simon Foreman, an amazing character who, who hung out in Shakespeare circles, reviewed Shakespeare's plays, went to, he reviewed um, uh, Banquo's Ghost. He, he was a kind of contemporaneous reviewer of Shakespeare's plays, uh, considered a complete quack by, um, by the kind of establishment but people would queue up to go and see him and like we found evidence that um he went to see um that robert burton went to see uh, simon foreman and, and right simon foreman this is kind of pre-safeguarding you know simon foreman tells this very sort of depressed 22 year old um that he that he will die suddenly it's in the notebooks they're in the ashmolean um in Ox in the university of oxford um you can see for yourself online actually they're, they're amazing his Simon Foreman's notebooks um, of the consultation and so that happens very early on he's told he'll die suddenly um, he's also given does his own um, horoscope which gives a sort of date of when he will when he will uh, w w the date that will prove fatal for him his 63rd year and he does die um, that year so anyway, there are strange, what's so interesting about him, we can't know, we can't know how much he truly believed that his fate had been sealed by his, by his horoscope, or that, that it was predetermined by his horoscope. But certainly it, he's a very, very interesting, he sits at a very interesting moment in history um, in terms of the story of delusions. Not only is he collecting them, but the idea again of the kind of, uh, the magical thinking required in in astrology and in terms of the scientific technology is often is often crops up in in delusions in all kinds of different centuries um, anxiety about technology about change um, apparently although it's not in the book apparently many people presented thinking that their stomachs had turned to concrete in the victorian 
in Victorian London when concrete was a new material. So technology, anxieties about looking again through glass, through lenses, looking at the sky, the, the planets must have seemed more powerful than they'd ever seemed because of, of the scientific um, uh, breakthroughs that were happening to do with telescopes. And so he's sitting in a kind of old world, new world position. And whilst he's intellectually brilliant at sort of standing back from it, from it and analyzing things, uh, you know, he's a good lesson that we can, we can be both things, can't we? We can understand things, but also um, there can be forces psychologically within us that um, concurrently are much less, um, what's the word, Re reserved or kind of, um, that are much more, that have skin in the game with, with fears and anxieties about the future. <laughs> However, even if you are the greatest, one of the greatest scholars of your, of your era. Yeah, and it's really hard to predict. It's really easy to fall into this crevice <clears throat> that leads to delusion because as you were saying, and I thought throughout, the new inventions really did push these things. And that's why I said in the introduction about jokingly how we are being listened to because I yes. see, right? So I see all of this. I don't know if it's delusionary or not, but I could be, but you don't know contemporaneously. And that's why I was thinking about unreliable narrators as suppose, and this is another Beatles reference. Um, the song, When I'm 64, where Paul's grandchildren on my knee, Vera, Chuck, and Dave. Well, suppose Stella, after that, decided she was going to name her grandchildren Vera, Chuck, and Dave. And then you could say, oh, Paul predicted this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 30 yes. years before. That is, ap that is apropos of nothing, but it's nice to write. <laughs> <laughs> but your book does generate, you know, it's like going down the rabbit hole, which is a phrase I don't like, but you, you know, and then I, then I had to look at uh, um, uh, Robinson, because I own a bookstore and I thought I need to get some of his books. They're all out of print. You can't find them even on Abe and they're expensive. It's so, and then your reference to Joseph Priestley and Benjamin Franklin, oh, yeah. who knew? But yeah, talk well, about- I know. Well, I mean, that's interesting. This is back to James Tilly Matthews, who's the, the right. tea broker who, who is a kind of, you know, he's an ordinary selling tea in London in the 1790s. And he gets himself into these public lectures, which by run by this man called David Williams, who was, you know, for a bright young man from Staffordshire, who, who just sort of snuck in at the back is how I can imagine it. And gets himself on this deputation to Paris, which is about to um, be consumed by, re by revolution. And he, so here's James Tilly Matthews in his 20s on a boat with Priestley, um, people who are dealing with, I mean, all of these unseen forces, it's fascinating, were being, you know, forces of physics um, were being, um, exper you know, experiments were, were, were explaining and demonstrating uh, unseen forces of physics for, for the first time. And, he, and James T. Matthews also will have encountered um, Mesmer, Franz Mesmer in Paris when he first went there. We don't know, it's tantalizing. I don't, I mean, he wouldn't have met, um, he, he would have seen these kind of, these demonstrations of magnetic forces that Mesmer had set up. Mesmer had, himself had left the city by the time James T. Matthews was there, but he'd left all of these um, people who were kind of running um, I guess they're kind of group therapy sessions, really. People sit round um, a contraption, a sort of, yeah, it was called a, a, a baquette. And, and, and the idea was that magnetic, electromagnetic forces would sort of help, um, could, could create, it's almost like a seance, but, the, you know, um, to do with improving your, your mental state. But and this is happening. There's, but there's, technology, there's technology in it. There's technology in it. And so it's not that big a leap if you're if you're if you're knowing that and this is this is science you know science is telling you that there are all these unseen forces that you can't see but that we're telling you we can scientifically prove exist that we nobody knew about before you've got the kind of god-shaped hole because that's exactly how god had been seen up until that point and it's not it's not a great leap then is it to imagining that 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 people you could have um unseen forces from from his um from his heirloom you know influencing politicians so again you have these kind of you know and, and i mean goodness knows what he would have and also the, there is a kind of prof, profit like quality to him when you think of the internet um and wi-fi now i mean particularly tricky time to be to be paranoid because as you say you know the, the machines are listening and and creating algorithms based on what you what you say and advertising things back at you 
but um, James T James Tilly Matthews's kind of vision of unseen forces, powerful unseen forces, um, having a kind of political subliminal effect on thinking is is uncanny when you when you think about the world we live in now, where we're all used to Wi-Fi. Um, you know, it, it's it's very it feels very um, it feels very kind of ahead of its time in terms of the potential dis disruption and how disturbing that idea is that there are forces at work that we can't see but we know exist and he, he he's kind of turning it into this art piece this kind of amazing imaginative um sort of um creation of the heirloom and and all of the, and the plot that's around it but actually um you know, it's something we're still wrestling with, isn't it? As, as mammals, <laughs> this idea, what, 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 what do we do with, with the knowledge of these unseen forces? Um, well, look what we're doing now. Look at you and I, how, right. are, we, how are we doing this? I, 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 I know, it's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible, it's impossible. So, so much of the world requires magical thinking, right? Yeah, and, and it did then, and so, so, it's just more of the magical thinking. I think glass has a similar thing. You know, it's, there's real magical thinking involved in believing that heating sand will create, yeah. will create glass. Um, and so again, you start to understand that those the leaps that these these kind of imaginative creations that people with a fully fully blown delusion, as it were, um, manage yeah. to kind of conjure up. It's not that big. It's not as big a leap as you might imagine when you first hear hear about them. Well, no. And Arthur C. Clarke in his second law basically states you can't test what's possible until you go to the impossible because you right. can't test the limits of the possible until you get just beyond it and that's yeah with glass who would have thought i can heat sand and create this clear material which i still think of as magical how can we see through a solid and what it is it yeah. is magical it is magical you know there's there's no question i mean i must say that the amazing punchline to to um to madame m so she's the woman who thought that her husband had been murdered and swapped for a double and that these children had been abducted um, and hidden under Paris. And it turns out she'd lost children in infancy. And my theory anyway is that her, her delusion was kind of answered. It's easier to believe that um, that there's a kind of conspiracy that the people haven't really died. They've been they've been abducted and buried than it is to believe in kind of horrible, random, painful, tragic events like the loss of a child. So that's how I came to kind of explain it to myself. But then there's this very strange thing that I discovered. So she's believing that um, in doubles and, you know, her, 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 the simple, the first thing is that her husband has been abducted and, and murdered and substituted. But then all kinds of other doubles and, and substitutions are happening in her in her delusion that she talks to her, her doctor, Joseph Capgra, about. And then I discovered um, buried in the French archives. Um, a map um, of Paris in the, during the First World War, which is when, when her, her um, delusion was really at its full kind of extent. Um, and the map shows that they were building um, a double, a fake Paris out of, okay. um, out of plasterboard, um, it, just north of Paris where the River Seine has a similar bend um, so it's essentially to, to act as a decoy to the bombers in the First World War. He would think it was Paris and bomb that. And they made several districts, life size. Um, they really did. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it when I um, when I found this. And I, I wanted to tell her desperately. I mean, I will. I suppose I just wondered what on earth she would have made of it. So she's got this delusion of doubles. And at exactly the same time, unbeknownst to her, she could never possibly have known. They were they are creating a double Paris just a few miles away from where she's living. Yeah. Str that, <laughs> right, stranger that, than fiction. Yes. Oh, it's so funny because I own a bookstore. I always like when there's something in a book and you start imagining, oh, how did they do this? And you think of these right angle uh, handles coming out of that. Is it Beckett? Uh, the bucket? Yes, I believe so. Yeah, Beckett. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have the illustration with six of them around there. I'm, I'm going, because you say it, I wonder how they could get 20 people around there. <laughs> I know. You think you should bring them back? Some, some back at demonstrations. Yeah, <laughs> be a, a relatively large one. And then I started, <laughs> I drew a picture and started measuring out. And that's, what, that's what's great about books is that you give it to us, but then we can do whatever we want with it, isn't it? It's like, and with your research, even though you were locked in, 
you even mentioned it one time. You say something about, oh, it's so it's so nice that on the internet you can research when you're trying to. Oh, uh, extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah, it's extraordinary what I found, and I mean it's a great privilege. Essentially, all of the parish records in in England and Wales that you know until very very recently you'd have had to know, for instance, that James C. Matthews was from Staffordshire and go and look in or go to the, each church in in Staffordshire, or perhaps there might be a county archive. Now they're all cross referenced within and a few letter changes, so you can find traces of people. Um, that maybe you know they often spelt an extra letter or a, a, you know that the spellings were often much more fluid and I was able to find out things about James Tilly Matthews that no one could possibly have discovered um, before these these archival searches were possible um, so that's that's really exciting and I I hope you know what I've tried to do is get as close as I possibly can to to what they were really living for uh, living through wrestling with in terms of marriages births deaths um political struggles to get a sense to get a closer sense of their daily lives as I could and then they ask questions and so I'm hope you know I in reading the book you know I, I see them all as kind of thrillers really they all have they all to my money have uh, for my money they are communicators they're, they're telling us something they're asking for interpretation that's the nature of the delusions um, and to pull up a chair and listen to them because there will be things I've missed you know that they, they are they're psychological mysteries and they're communiques to to be encrypted um and I hope I hope people will um find more in them you know I've I, I've interpreted them my own way but I've done my very best to find <clears throat> as much as I can of their reality to, to make sense of their alternative reality if that makes sense and I'm I'm intrigued to know what other people make of <coughs> how other people might uh, come to understand them too because there's there's no definitive answer of course not. And then you know you, the other thing is that you take a book like Tristram Shandy, which is one of my favorite books, mm. and then I would have never known in a million years that part of the book is it, it seems like in Tristram Shandy everything takes up a hundred pages, right? But, <laughs> right. but I would never have known that part of your book is kind of included in that <laughs> yeah well, it's nice to be mentioned in the same breath but it's no it's um I mean and the other you know the other side of the story is that I've done you know it's very um deliberately I mean I'm a historian and I <coughs> I looked at this as social history um and of course you know with his pre-scanner so that the neurological dimension to these stories as you alluded to in the introduction you know that there are now there's all sorts of understanding with new scanning technology technology again can see what's going on in the brain doubles doubles is actually probably the clearest one that I've discovered anyway that connects to very identifiable dis dysfunction malfunctioning in the right front of the brain where sense of self sense of other is and there's as you mentioned Lewy body's form of dementia they can see very clearly when that when that's disrupted so I believe the neurologists say the left brain, so recognition and familiarity is disrupted. You know somebody, but you don't know who they are. You can't, and your left brain sort of steps in with a story. We're great. We tell stories, don't we, to, to, to clarify uh, confusion to ourselves. And so the belief, I, I, I think, is that, that the left brain then tells the story, which becomes the delusion, um, that in fact, it's not the person you know. It can't be because... They're not quite, you, they don't feel familiar even though they are recognized and so or they're not recognized even though they're familiar they must be a double uh, they must be a sub they must have been substituted the real one must have been um must have been abducted and taken away and you know how much i mean i still think that the psychological interpretation of madame m that the reasons why you know freud was onto this you know it's absolutely crucial to his his ideas the idea that doubles are a way of not consciously of course unconsciously but a way of of rebranding uncomfortable feelings you know that it's it's easier to to believe somebody is a is a double or a doppelganger than it is to think I don't really like or know the person I live with you know the, uh, <laughs> which is a pretty unbearable idea um so I I think you know in terms of the book and it's true of many not just of the double of Madame M but you know the psychological lens that I put on it uh, on, on these characters often before the, the, all the vocabulary of, of psychoanalysis existed um, is one part of the jigsaw and I, I think it's been missing 
but I, I have to acknowledge and I think it's interesting rather than uh, undermining that there may be other neurological stories that if we could scan these people it's possible that King of France, King Charles VI of France, you know he described as having very very severe um, uh, fevers in adolescence and fevers crop up again and again in the backstory of people who um, who have delusions perhaps there was a there was a part that that had played uh, in in some kind of brain disruption um, that played a part in his glass delusion we can't know and you know that that dance between brain science which really took over and threw all the other stuff away so this is my attempt is to sort of bring you know redress that balance by seeing how much we can understand psychologically and I do think we can uh, but I, I must of course acknowledge that there will be other dimensions too that will run along at the same time you know? yeah it's interesting because throughout the book there are so many characters and so much research that you've done and for the most part yes there's some there are some men and women who are charlatans who have some kind of bad uh, intent but when you think about it none of those who are delusionary are are painted as bad people you know mm. has but having a delusion doesn't mean that you're morally bereft in any way it simply means something else it means something else it means that's that's beautifully put thank you i i think that's precisely right and it's you know i suppose i it, very simple ways i i i see it as yes okay yes these are crazy <laughs> but there but something very real is being said too what is it you know and I've come to feel enormous um, compassion and kind of very impressed by the ingenuity of these people yeah. in, in, in creating that. I do see them as protective often um, quite clearly they're strat strategic unconsciously, but ways of processing a massive reversal of fortune, um, humiliation, um, you know, conflict as we talked about earlier um, or just poetic kind of metaphor, a way, a way of telling worlds how to treat us. And they're they're blooming ingenious, you know. They're so, but I, I I'm so touched by how um how clever people are at, at doing that, at kind of creating these um alternative realities for themselves. Uh, it it's it's impressive. And of course, I mean, it did a, a you know it's important to kind of sound a a cautionary note because certain types you know are, are to be taken seriously, and um you know paranoid conspiracy erotomania the belief that that somebody of high status is in love with you it's dangerous you know to the person and to the person the object of it because of course it's ingenious because it, it means that it's not your responsibility it's nothing to do with you you know they're in love with they're in love with me um it kind of denies any responsibility or agency for your own behavior and so there are they are they are to be taken very very seriously they're not whimsical and some of them do present a kind of potentially dangerous oversimplification or over justification or denial of responsibility that you sort of have to keep in the back of your mind um but i but i but fundamentally yes i think i think what they show me above anything is that we, human nature we all want to be worthy of attention and interpretation yeah. and, we, and, and, and we all want that and i think fundamentally that's what all of these 10 people want and i think it's a dignified respectable thing to want <laughs> yeah. and they don't have none of them have at least as you paint them and you could be wrong none of them seem to have character flaws whereas a lot of the people who deal with them do and then that led me to and what you were saying is because they're so intelligent uh and coherent and articulate in their delusions mm -hmm. part of me starts thinking oh maybe they're <laughs> Maybe they're right. Maybe devils do exist, or maybe we live in a solipsistic universe, which is what most many of them must have thought. And if we did, then only one of us is talking. Which of us is delusionary? You know. Yes. And and then once you you know you can't go too far. Well, I I had to. I can't go too far down that. Path. Yeah. I mean, of course, the second well, chapter three, um, looking at Francis Spiro, who's an Italian lawyer. You know, of course, the, the heresy or is one person's heresy is another person's religious belief you know he's he's the closest i got to that topic really so he he um 
he has a delusion of damnation. He believes that um, he gets caught up in the Counter Reformation in Italy in the 1400s, and he in the 1500s, and he's uh, you know, he, he's in lot, all kinds of trouble, like everybody, like people whose delusions tend to be, um, and comes to believe that God's appeared to him and said because he he recounted his true faith. Uh, that he's damned for all eternity and he deserves to be burned and he stops Those eating. Words that, the words that he was saying on the way when he was going home after he recanted where did mm. you get those words from god are they did you just oh, they are on nathaniel bacon's account so there were there, many many people wrote up they, they all claimed to have been at his bedside when he died he sort of starved himself to death so they said he kind of denied himself it was suicide essentially but he you know he was um he he just stopped eating and all these other lawyers from north italy from from the university that he was he was attached to were around his bedside and and all wrote up the story and um many of them wrote up different versions they were collated they made it around europe the printing press helped them you know so this story became a kind of core celeb and made it to robert burton interestingly he's in robert his story is in robert burton's book so Robert Burton had heard about this uh, man who believed that he was damned. But the idea of, you know, I think it's the story that as a historian, not wanting to fall down, forgive me, that rabbit hole of who gets to decide who's delusional and who isn't. You know, for me, it's best told by the story of a man who who is kind of dies by <laughs> at, the, at the hands of, you know, heresy and belief and who decides what's delusional and what is as faith. And that's, oh, that's, that's one that we haven't quite solved, is it? So, no. you know. <laughs> that's the thing is, you know, most of the time you're talking about individuals, but with King Charles, you you have, he, he has followers who now believe they're made of glass. So I was thinking, yeah, throughout the book, I kept thinking, okay, is this a delusion or is it not? So then I thought mm. specifically of the Shroud of Turin. So there's many, many people who believe that it was actually the shroud that was wrapped around Jesus. Mm. There are the wounds, uh, there's his face. And then there's people like me, there's no empirical evidence of any kind, therefore I do not believe it. But those who believe it, they're not delusionary, correct? They just have a belief. Or are they delusionary? They have a theory, don't they? Yes. I mean, they have a theory. Um, yes, I wouldn't call that delusional. Um, it's simply a, 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 a belief I don't, um, Adhere to. I don't agree with. But it is, I mean, it, it's a very um, unwieldy subject. And yes. so the definition, the kind of fixed false belief about yourself that's as close as we can get without falling into kind of existential uh, rabbit hole, you know, that as close as we can get to, well, it's, it's, it's away from the generally accepted, generally agreed version of the truth, let's put it that way. Well, then and of what course- if someone, What if someone's simply narcissistic, like our former president? Right. Is, yeah. is he delusionary? I mean, it's really hard. You've made it really difficult for me, mm, which again mm. is good because I have to think about this after I put your book down. So, <laughs> yeah, so I like, mean, that... if, if we were closing this out, which we're close to, and I'm putting you on the spot, but who's delusional today? Or what theories are delusional in our society today? There's a good question. There's a good question. Can you interpret the world through? I think, I think it's a very useful um lens i mean as a historian i have to say let let the right the, the, listen to these stories or read these stories and and let the rhymes speak for themselves um i think they do i mean i think they're a and as i said i mean the q on the kind of the idea that um big state is is up to something you know the idea well for this you know that, that the real threats let's say for argument's sake covid or you know fill in the blanks is is the, the belief that they're not true but that there is a, a, a conspiracy afoot from the from from the state um the, the kind of flip of, of um what's really a threat and what isn't really a threat and we can all have our opinions on that but that 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 is a a th you know I, I, the story of james tilly matthews speaks to that i would argue but actually as i say it's what's really fascinated me and i missed it initially was madame m so she's the 20s housewife who believes her husband's been swapped for a double she actually has her story i think is most useful in terms of understanding oh what the kind of 
um, conspiracies and potential delusions that we have going on at the moment. Her, I think there's something in her story. And as I say, she has the story of buried children. There are all kinds of visual uh, images that have cropped up again um, in terms of what people are believing is going on and the danger of the secret things that are that are a threat to us according to these according to these online theories um and it's been remarkable to me that she it's her story actually which doesn't seem on the surface to be a conspiracy theory of the same uh, of the same story i think she has in her story is something that we can reflect on and i just ask people to read it and think about it because i it's it, there are rhymes and and uh, echoes um, and I and real meaning in there, and it's not not very um, reassuring. <laughs> well, I but thought to myself, <laughs> I thought to myself, well, don't blame yourself for not knowing what's delusionary in today's society, because Victoria only knows it from the perspective of history. So, yeah, and I think know. that they, I still think that hearing those, I think that it's helped me navigate perceiving my um, the society I'm in now in Britain. Uh, we have yeah. our own we have our own um, delusions going on politically, too. And, um, you know, I, I I have found it that I found these characters waypoints. They've they've helped me to um, me to too. look at my own society. And I, they don't present, of course, any conclusive answers. But I hope other people will find them interesting vantage points to, yeah, to, look, at, to look at where they are, where we are now. I think it's OK that you don't provide answers. I think that's my job or it's my job as well as I can do it. But as a reader, so, yeah. But so like with BBC4 then, uh, as we close, um, what's your next, well, you got derailed on this one. Um, <laughs> do, you, yeah. I, do you have anything to go back to that you were starting that you <laughs> Well, I did make the series about the history of the heart, which uh, I went back and made that. Um, I'm, I'm writing my next book about uh, an Edwardian antiquarian, um, in London called George Fabian Lawrence, who, um, who, so I'm halfway through that book now, who had, I don't know if you, many of your listeners may have heard of a, a, a cache of jewels called the Cheapside Hoard. No. I don't know if you have, they were Tudor and Stuart jewels that were buried under, under the city of London. And they were found in 1912 by navvies that were digging out uh, the foundations for the tall buildings in Edwardian um, London a bit earlier. Um, and they brought it to his shop. So it's a story of kind of um, archaeology before it was professionalized. Lots of um, skullduggery and lack of provenance and um, amazing jewels. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm buried, I'm buried in the archives of that. It's, um, it's amazing. The research is amazing. Like I said, the illustrations are wonderful. And I have to wait till July 19th in the States before I can put it on our front table at the bookstore, but I look forward to the next one and hopefully to talking to you at that time about oh, it. Oh, I'd love to. I so enjoyed talking to you. Likewise. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.